Hello and welcome to The Green Room by Deloitte, an award-winning podcast where we explore the topics that matter most in business. I'm Ethan Worth and this is episode 50, where we ask, what's the truth behind financial crime? We're dealing with a Colombian drug cartel that was selling a billion euros worth of cocaine on each year on the streets of, of Europe. So look at the return on investment from the bad guy side. It's a pretty great business. It's game changing. I've seen it so many times in my career. When you do that, you, you get an aha moment. They don't care what product they're trafficking in. Humans, mm. illegal arms, narcotics, yeah. elephant ivory. Okay, so after tackling uh, behavioral science and leadership, we're now delving into the dark world of financial crime. And to join me after 49 episodes behind the camera, we're joined by Tiffany. How are you, Tiffany? Really good, thank you, considering that I've been behind the scenes all of this time, but it's really lovely to join you. Lizzie can make it today, unfortunately, due to family circumstances. I'm just jumping in for her and trying to do her proud. But yeah, what are we chatting about today? Well, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, Yes, no, we're talking all about financial crime. And to do that, we need two excellent guests. And please introduce them. So first of all, I'd love to introduce you to David Fine, who is special counsel in the litigation department at Paul Weiss, also special advisor at Standard Chartered Bank. He's also served as associate White House counsel during the Clinton administration, and he was assistant US attorney in the Southern District of New York. Welcome, David. Thank you so much. It's great to have you. Also, love to introduce you to Sir Rob Wainwright. Uh, Rob is a senior partner at Deloitte North and South Europe working on cyber and financial crime. Rob was formerly executive director of Europol coordinating operations against cyber, criminal and terrorist networks and he's also the chair of a global expert group with the Global Coalition to Fight Financial Crime. It's really great to have you Rob. Thanks Stephanie, great to be here. Welcome to the studio. But before we dive into the episode, we wanted to get a good understanding of what financial crime actually is. And so we're going to go back to school with a professor. Uh, So Dr. Kelly Richmond Pope is an author, a forensic accounting expert, and she's also a professor at DePaul University in Chicago. And we asked her to give us a really quick financial crime 101. Here's what she had to say. From my point of view, um, all crime is financial crime. And if you really think about it, All roads always lead back to money, missing money, mismanaged money, stolen money. So I think all all crimes are really financial crimes. I mean, if you think about it, why aren't they? I mean, you you think of any case and the case was probably disputed because there was an issue over money. And so um, I think about financial crimes being the the theft of um, a monetary asset or um, the yeah, the theft of a monetary asset. And so that theft can be a physical asset, that that, that theft could be a, um, you know, a transaction that was made or not made or lied upon. But, you know, again, I think all crimes are financial crimes. And so I think that that's what makes um, financial crimes so rampant and, and widespread because money is the foundation and the problem in all of them. Thank you so much to Kelly for joining us for that. You can hear more about her story and her work in an interview that we'll be releasing soon. I think we're going to delve into some of that detail throughout the conversation today. But first of all, I think you both have fascinating backgrounds working in, in this area. I don't think we could have asked for but get better guests on this topic. And so we'd love to hear some of your stories and your examples uh, of your careers. So David, you've served during the White House um, Clinton administration. And so you've taught classes on, on federal criminal prosecution as well at Yale Law School. Can you talk a little bit about how you ended up working in, in this area and what's maybe kept you focused on, on this as well? Sure. I, I started early in my career as a lawyer as a young federal prosecutor in Manhattan. And crime, looked at all sorts of types of crime. But when you're in Manhattan, New York City, a big financial capital, almost every case that a young prosecutor has there Mm -hmm. involves financial crime. So certainly got an interest in in pursuing that. Uh, And it was often more in the securities fraud context and Wall Street. And then under President Obama, I was appointed as U.S. Attorney for the District of Connecticut and oversaw all the prosecutions there. And there I got a different glimpse of financial crime because we had a specialty in Connecticut on pursuing and going after um, human trafficking cases. And then I saw the connection 
between whether it's financial fraud, securities fraud, human trafficking, narcotics trafficking, on top of that is this common theme of financial crime. Mm -hmm. All of these crimes are greed motivated, and so it's all about the money and money laundering, and to go after them requires a common toolbox, whether it's human trafficking, narcotics trafficking, or insider trading. There are some uh, common themes that we folks in the enforcement community use to pursue it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting to to hear, especially just how much it goes into human nature, right, and how they're driven by by greed. Um, Rob, maybe to, just to turn to you for a second mm -hmm. as well. You've got a wealth of experience in, in this area, and particularly your your role as um, executive director for Europol. Mm -hmm. It'd be great to hear a bit about your experience. It was a great there. job. I was there for nine years. Uh, before that, you know, I began my career here in the UK in national security domain, mm -hmm. really kind of terrorism. Um, and, and, you know, pick up on David's point, you know, the thread throughout my 27, 30 year law enforcement career, the thread, whether or not I was helping to counter terrorism here or, or go after drug traffic, major drug traffickers, cyber crooks or whatever, the thread always is the illegal use of profits for terrorism, it finances terrorism, we know that. Um, and, and, and in the business of so much of, of serious crime, where they're making industrial levels of, of profits mm. and estimated $2 trillion a year. Um, you know, that's, 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 that's a lot of dirty money that's, that's going through the system, that's mm. propping up a lot of very serious real-world harm, as David was saying, to people. So I've been in the business, like so many others, of trying to do something about that. And mm. at Europol, you know, we, we, we ran a lot of operations, 60,000 a year, um, all of which had a dimension around going after the money, seeing where the money was going, joining the dots essentially between different cases, uh, connecting the UK with Denmark, with Greece, with Italy, um, uh, far and wide, and increasingly with the United States. And, and that was a, a formative part of my, um, my, my career, where we had the opportunity to see the grand scale right across Europe, and indeed uh, other parts of the world, of, of how big crime operates, mm. and it's, it's serious business. We were dealing with, to give you one story, you know, we were dealing with a Colombian drug cartel that was selling a billion euros worth of cocaine on each year on the streets of, of Europe. And they were employing professional money launderers, money men, um, to, to collect that hard cash, because it was all in cash, the cash business, mm. of course, and launder it. And what do we mean by laundering? Basically, hiding the origins of it, cleaning it up so that the the criminal gang, uh, paymasters back at home can use it in a way where the authorities wouldn't notice. And and the business of these professional money launderers would be to try and sneak it through the system and clean it up. And that's one case mm. of a billion. And, and what does that mean in the real world? That's a billion euros worth of, of hard drugs sold on the streets of Europe, you mm. know affecting the lives of so many people. And that's going on on an industrial scale all the time. And the motivation that, that we had, that so many of us have in this business of fighting financial crime is to stop that from happening, to stop that harm to our people, to our citizens and to our economy. It mm. feels like a million miles away from our, our role here in the green room, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We're playing our part, definitely. <laughs> and what, what about your current roles? What are some of the things that you're focusing on right now? So I've gone, uh, I've had a career where I've spent time in the public sector and in the mm -hmm. private sector and uh, have moved uh, between the two. And each time that with this common theme of fighting financial crime, of fighting the ills behind it. Um, and so now I've been in the private sector since uh, mm -hmm. I retired as US attorney. And my most recent position was I spent uh, eight plus years as general counsel at Standard Chartered Bank, a big global financial institution. And as Rob was saying, um, the, for the syndicate leaders behind these crimes, they want that money cleaned and they don't want the cash. And they want to have, they're not going to touch the drugs, they're not going to touch the, the human trafficking victims, they're staying away from that and looking for um, the money to be cleaned, but they're behind the, the crime. And in fact, to go after the crime, it's most important to go after them. Mm. And so the financial system and financial institutions have a huge role to play in detecting this kind of activity going through the system, unwittingly going through and well disguised, but with technology, with 
really talented human beings mm. um, focused on this in a financial crime compliance program, banks have a huge role to play, as do other parts of the private sector. And so as general counsel at Standard Chartered Bank, I had lots of colleagues, and we focused very much on how do we do a better job, mm. we at Standard Chartered, mm. and we across the financial industry at identifying and reporting this kind of activity to law enforcement, where I used to be, where Rob used to be. Um, so law enforcement can get the freshest, uh, most uh, actionable intelligence to go do their work. Mm -hmm. And so I spent a lot of time um, uh, this past decade working on that, both at one institution, but more broadly across the industry. Mm. I think that's a really important uh, point that David makes. Now, now I partner with Deloitte, have been for five years, um, you know, working with some amazing colleagues here, you know, mm -hmm. who are helping the industry, um, financial sector especially, but also government, uh, and, and, and many other stakeholders in this business, to, to get the glue right, to bring the ecosystem together in a better way. This is such a big problem, such a complex one. We're up against, as I said, professional money launderers that are very smart at, at at, at their business, and you know, we've often failed ourselves as a system uh, to to, mm. to to work in a more cohesive way. And David and I, you know, have been part of trying to do something about that between big government and and, and industry for many years. Um, and the chance of Deloitte to do that as well, just to help help the industry come together, is really inspiring opportunity. Um, we're starting from a very low base. I was so frustrated at Europol by what I was seeing about how poor our performance collectively has been um, mm. across the years in fighting financial crime. We're mm. just not seizing anything like the quantities yeah. of dirty money that we'd like. And But now we're doing something about it. And there's an energy, there's a buzz about the place, mm -hmm. um, I think, um, which is which is really encouraging. Yeah, I think we read something like 1% or something estimates say of, of elite, illicit funds are, are, are captured. Is that, is that about? Yeah, we did, uh, I do report, we did a definitive, well, at the time was a definitive study across mm so many operations and we were pretty clear about what our estimates were that are, as you say Ethan about one percent only so if you think about that um, you know the, this is the frustrating thing the levels of investment historically that have been put in on the side of the good guys as it were you know governments that have enacted so much legislation in the EU we're on to the sixth talking about the sixth uh, anti-money laundering directive sixth revision that's how much legislation how, how much regulation that spawn um, mm how many regulators, indeed, a regulatory industry it has. And the banks then that, that have to enforce these anti-money laundering regulations, as David knows very well, mm. and, and have to deploy so much resources. In the UK, they spend £34 billion pounds a year just on complying with financial mm. crime. So you think about all of that collectively um, as the investment into fighting financial crime. And, mm. and, and one measure of it, what the return on this in, in enormous investment is, 1%. I mean, one percent. Mm -hmm. Come on, guys. So that's what's really inspired, I think, people like David and me and other leaders to really shake the system and do something about this. Mm -hmm. And the real shame of it has been, despite that effort and all of that energy going into it, it's been very rule-based. And so mm -hmm. rules are created, and then uh, there's a lot of time spent assessing compliance with those rules between government and the private sector. Okay. But very rarely does effectiveness get assessed. Mm. So right. can you can you show that you follow this rule and that rule? Great. But what does it matter if we're not actually being effective? Yeah. And if we have a 1% um, seizure rate mm. yeah. on, on illegal money, all of that, that's 99% that's getting through. Yeah. And it's tax-free. Mm. So look at the return on investment from the bad guy side. It's a pretty great business. And in some of the areas that are even more neglected than others, like environmental crime and illegal wildlife trafficking, for example, mm. it's a much higher return on mm -hmm. their dollar than even that. So it's a, yeah. it's a phenomenal business, unfortunately, um, and that's what we need to step up our effort to be much more effective at disrupting it. Mm. Yeah. Sounds like the work that you're doing at the moment as well is, obviously you mentioned at the start, follow the money, that's how you get to, to the crime, but obviously it's about so much more than just money and the um, human and societal cost of, mm. of this is, is so huge, so it'd be great to delve a little bit more into that just to understand the scale and the ramifications of, of, of the problem. And um, perhaps you could talk about, I don't know, is there a case that really opened your 
eyes to the gravity of the of the situation maybe that you can think of at the start of your careers that you went oh this is this is how serious this is i mean there are many cases each one of them is an, is an incredible story because if you realize it, 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 people think of financial crime as victimless crime mm. it's just a, it's just a money transaction mm -hmm. but these crimes are hugely um brought with victims rob talked about the colombian narcotics and you think about all of that uh, all of those drugs on the streets, and you take any one of those stories, when you take a mm. human trafficking case. Mm. When I was U.S. attorney for the District of Connecticut, we did a significant number of human trafficking investigations and prosecutions, and we, I continue to work on anti-human trafficking efforts. Each one of those cases, mm. horrible stories mm. about victims, victims being brought to countries um, on false pretenses, thinking they're going to get a better life, and earn money and have independence, but their international uh, identity documents, their passports are withheld. They're first forced to work in terrible conditions, um, and sometimes with sexual crimes, other times just with horrible labor situations. And they make very little of that money themselves, mm. and they're essentially held prisoner. And the profits from all of that are going to the organized crime syndicates, and. So when we look at that, that's something that financial institutions and other private sector entities can, can help on. So we had a program in Connecticut where we asked um, hotels and motels. We gave them training on what to look for to detect the smuggling and the holding of human trafficking victims so they could report to the FBI and others in law enforcement. So it's engaging a, kind of a whole of yeah. society response you make some great points, David. I was going to say the same thing about modern slavery. There are 40 million victims mm -hmm. worldwide. Every one of them has a story. And every, and every one of those stories mm -hmm. are, are, are not nice to listen to. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've stayed connected with the world of fighting modern slavery since, you know, I work on a global charity, you know, where I meet many survivors of that. And, and when you listen to them, um, it, it just, in very vivid terms, brings to life why this, this matters. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and the quantity here, you know, the t I keep going back to this idea that there are, you know, two trillion dollars worth of criminal profits that are laundered each year. That's just a scale that's staggering. The, the amount of crime that has to happen every day, everywhere in the world, certainly in, in the United Kingdom, to produce that kind of volume of, mm -hmm. of criminal business mm -hmm. is just mind blowing in, 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 in such a terrible way, of course. Yeah. And everyone has. David was saying, you unpack every element of that as a story, a life story that's been destroyed. And it could just be, you know, a, a grandmother that's lost her savings because she's been defrauded by mm -hmm. these, these, these people who are making dirty money in that way, for example. Or it could be just, just you know, a teenage boy who's, who's been led astray, gone down the wrong route, consumed some drugs, and that's, that's his going to be his life story for the next mm. X number of years. And every one of these stories tells you about the importance of, of fighting financial crime in a better way. And it, it needs to be a lot better than 1% if mm -hmm. we're going to have the kind of impact that we want to have in protecting society from, this, from these terrible crimes. Did you know at Deloitte we support social enterprises through our 5 Million Futures programme? Like Change Please, they use 100% of the profits from their award-winning coffee to help people experiencing homelessness. They offer training, employment and ongoing support with housing, finances and therapy. Why not sign up to the Change Please Coffee Club to receive weekly deliveries of coffee beans? Or try out one of their blends? Just head to changeplease.org or check out the show notes. Now back to our topic of the day. And David, you're, you're the chair of the United for Wildlife Financial Task Force. Um, could you speak a bit about that? I mean, for me, it, it, it kind of spoke to the scale of the problem that I wouldn't really connect wildlife tra trafficking with financial crime. Obviously, of course, they make criminal proceeds, so it makes sense. But yeah, so could you maybe speak about some of the work that you do there? Sure, and you're not the only one. <laughs> uh, that, that, that has been, um, that's been my work uh, on this subject has been simply that, which is mm -hmm. letting people know that it's much more than just a conservation crime. Mm. And when I say just a conservation crime, I mean no disrespect to conservationists and those who have been pursuing it for years and decades. They've done a brilliant job. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, and it is a serious conservation crime. But what makes it so dangerous and why there's so much of it is because it's a very profitable financial yeah. crime. And it's not fair to leave 
conservationists up against transnational organized crime mm -hmm. who are essentially commodity agnostic. They don't care what mm -hmm. product they're trafficking in, humans, mm -hmm. illegal arms, narcotics, yeah. elephant ivory, rhino horn, pangolin scales. Mm -hmm. Where They're looking at a risk reward ratio. Yeah. Where is their profit? Where is their little danger? Unfortunately for endangered species, it was in um, wildlife trafficking was a very high, has been a very high risk reward for transnational organized crime. So under the leadership of Prince William, um, we formed uh, United for Wildlife and in particular a financial task force where we have brought together over 50 of the world's uh, largest and not always large, but very strategically and located uh, banks and other financial institutions mm. to improve their awareness of this crime and how to look for it and how to report it. I think you've and both given us a really good understanding of the, the breadth mm -hmm. and the scale of the problem. And I think it'd be great to talk about some solutions now mm. as well. And uh, <laughs> Rob, you mentioned obviously that we have to do better than recovering mm. that 1%. Mm. Um, what, what could we win here? What could we maybe just uh, uh, think about what, what we're fighting for? Mm. If we re recovered even a few more percentage mm. points, what could we do with that money for good? Well, what what could we do with it? I think I think it's it's it's, it's a great it's a great story about um, first of all taking that illegal money away from mm -hmm. from criminals um, so that they they can't redistribute it and 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 therefore grow further in their yeah. criminal capability. But we can also use it, of course. It comes into the public purse, and so we we can use it for for, for good in society. But the real question is how to do it, of course, mm. Tiffany. And I think. Um, you know, in my experience, first of all, the regular, this is a highly regulated area, particularly for the big banks, as David knows better than me. Uh, and it's so highly regulated for the right reasons mm -hmm. that it, 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 it isn't really a, a, an area conducive to a flexibility or, or, or to, to great innovation. For example, generally in many countries, banks are prevented from sharing information about suspected financial crime with each other. Or even with law enforcement in some cases, mm -hmm. and and that doesn't help. That's 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 a very um, unfortunate uh, byproduct of the system. And in, in my experience in law enforcement, and particularly in my early experience of how successfully we fought terrorism, and what we did at Europol is that in this case you follow the money by following the data. Mm -hmm. If you can find access, if you can, if you can reach the right data points, connect them and use modern data analytics to see where the joins in the network are happening, that's what's going to power your, your, your insight in a different way. You're going to see, therefore, much more about the real nature of the criminal activity that's going on. And, of mm. course, with that information, that allows law enforcement to be a lot more proactive and effective in arresting the right people and dismantling the right crimes. At the moment, we don't see most of the financial crime problem because we're not doing well enough in connecting the data points between the different actors. That's at the heart of this, mm -hmm. and that's what is changing now. Actually, that's the positive thing about it, and and it's something that you know David and I could speak uh, for a long time about <laughs> what we call what we call public-private partnerships, which mm -hmm. is bringing government agencies, law enforcement agencies together with the industry, with the big banks, and many others to get that those golden nuggets of data. And when you can crunch it using very modern technology, mm -hmm. you see those insights suddenly, and it's 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 game changing. I've seen it so many times in my career. When you do that, you, you get an aha moment. That's where the crime is. That's who's running it. Let's go after him or her. What's good about this, and I agree with everything that Rob just said, what's good about this is we know the answer. It's also what's frustrating about this because mm. it's taking us a long time to yeah. implement that answer. And we exist in silos, in, um, in government, even within government, law enforcement can exist in silos country silos, so we're not, they're not, so not enough cross-border cooperation, um, or even within a country, different agencies doing their thing and not sharing that data and not getting a full review. And then we exist in silos on the private side, mm. in the private sector. And early on as a prosecutor, I used to see criminals taking advantage of a single bank, but using their different branches to do their activity and counting on the fact that the branches wouldn't speak with each other. So banks got better at that and started looking across their branches and seeing that there was the same person going and withdrawing a certain amount um, across branches one day. It's just entirely suspicious and, you, and it leads to information. 
But then you have to also break down the silos between and among banks. And it can be very hard to do that because of regulation. Yeah. Regulation that's well motivated, but doesn't take into account the need to do it for the right reasons, which is for national security and protecting victims of these crimes. So I've spent the last 10 years essentially working as hard as I can to break those silos down. Mm. And it's so important that we do that because our adversary does that very well. Mm. The transnational organized crime don't operate in silos. They don't operate with regulations that are, restric that are restricting the sharing of information. Yeah. They don't worry about geographic boundaries. Yeah. So they're taking advantage of all of that opportunity and quite aware of the fact that we are limited in how we approach it. Yeah. And so there is, as Rob said, what's exciting, um, still too slow from, from my mind, is are some really good efforts that Rob and I have um, helped initiate and support and lead where we break down those silos, we bring information together, and we create actionable intelligence that leads to um, results. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and you both spoke about technology and how mm. that's helping you to kind of connect the dots in a more sophisticated way. Mm. But I expect that technology can be a bit of a double-edged sword. So it's probably making your life harder as well with more sophisticated criminal activity, fraud, um, all the stuff that's happening with crypto, adding an extra element of financial complexity. Could you maybe talk a bit about some of the, some of the advances in technology that are helping and also some of the ones that are making it even well, let me, let me go first to some, I think you're right around in, in the sense that all modern technologies, without exception, mm -hmm. um, have been exploited by criminals. Yeah. Everyone. Um, and you mentioned cryptos, for example, Ethan, you know, cryptos, cryptocurrencies, uh, among other things, are, are a money laundering vehicle, um, you know, a way in which, which um, dirty profits can be can be uh, laundered, can be can be hidden. It's also um, so, um, a fundamental part about why we have such a large problem with ransomware, for example, because very often the, the cyber crooks behind are demanding payment of ransom um, through crypto. So, so that's, it's a good example of how technologies are always uh, exploited by the bad side as well. But on our side, of course, modern technologies have, have taken us much further forward in our ability to, as I said, analyze complex data sets, for example, automate a lot of the processes of trying to identify suspicious activity um, in, in the banking sector, uh, for example. Uh, and now with the, with the uh, development of AI capabilities, you know, uh, the opportunity to have much greater, more instantaneous insight into the real nature of the problem that we are currently not seeing. I agree completely. What's necessary, though, for us to take advantage of that technology is breaking down the silos mm. yeah. so that we can better understand the data and and act on it. But I think it'd be great to talk as well about who is actually responsible. You both mentioned an all of society approach is needed to, to get to a solution and to address this. Surely it can't just be down to law enforcement or, or cyber teams. What can we all do and who really needs to work together on this to, to get to a better place? I think it starts with our political leaders, mm -hmm. um, you know, because, and you can see how it does make a difference. So. Um, you know, the, the, the quite impressive response by Western governments to Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine mm -hmm. and imposing financial sanctions. You know, move some mountains and put in place quite a um, far-reaching program, effective program right across the banking sector, which is sometimes difficult for the banks to fully implement because it's so being done at speed and it's very complex. But as an example of when, you know, when politicians, when leaders really want to do something that they can press the buttons and, and, and it happens essentially. And I'd like to see you know, more of that mm -hmm. um, um, right across the, all, all different financial crime domains. So, yeah, I agree. It, I think um, we're seeing, that's a great example because we've seen there some real strengths in response, in timing, but also in information sharing and cross-border. Mm. So it, it brought countries together in a way and unlocked some sharing that hasn't happened too often in other areas. And yet, if you don't unlock it across the financial crime area, you're going to lose because the money is moving country to country. Victims are, are being transported in the human trafficking case. In environmental crime, it is absolutely the case that you know, the, the resource-rich countries are losing their natural resources and they're being transported cross-border. We have to be communicating. There are some really good signs of it. Um, 
the response to Russia's invasion of the Ukraine is a great one, and then there are smaller ones. Secretary Yellen, the Treasury Secretary of the United States, earlier this year announced a collaboration agreement with South Africa on illegal wildlife trafficking. Mm -hmm. And so right now, U.S. and South Africa, where there is a lot of um, interaction by the criminals, in some of the, a case I mentioned um, out, of, out of New York is an example of that, um, if we can be in constant dialogue with one another, create ways of sharing information that are appropriate, that are legitimate, that are transparent, but that are at speed mm. and full, we can go after things so much better. A mm. And so I'm very excited about those kinds of initiatives. The US and the UK have a lot of bilateral um, work underway that, that is promising, including in the, in the response to, um, to the Russia's invasion. And, and that's bringing, bringing kind of a, a full team approach. And sometimes it is a horror like the invasion that, that then shows you what can be done. Mm -hmm. And now look at that in the area of financial fraud, where we don't have necessarily the, the call to action that we have in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, it's a commitment of resources mm -hmm. and a will to go after this and make it a priority. What about the everyday person? So someone like myself or Ethan, our listeners, is there anything that you'd like to ask them to do? To I'm just thinking, we talk a lot about sort of small actions having big consequences in the firm, for example, you know, flagging that suspicious email that comes in. Could one person help bring down an organized crime network? That's a great question. It's a daunting task, um, and each of us knows that, right, from our, our own email, our own telephones, mm -hmm. and the number of attempts that we see coming in, and yeah. what do you do with that? Um, having an effective kind of way for people to report activity mm -hmm. is important. Um, my biggest advice is, to, is just to be wise and be smart and mm -hmm. understand um, and be careful when unknown people are coming to you or people that you know, seem to be known, but if you just look at, if you actually go look at the email address, it's not the name that's been, um, that's, that's been identified. It's, it is, it's a phony, phony name. Um, it's very hard, I think, at, a, at an individual level. I mean, you, mm -hmm. there are reporting systems, but these are happening every day. Each of us is getting them mm -hmm. multiple times a day. Um, so I think we, we do need to make that, um, we have to have a robust process and for an individual person my advice is always just be careful be wise you know understand especially in the fraud context i'll just be aware of if you're going to engage in, in the in the black market economy and you're going to buy a, a knockoff rolex watch or if that's your individual choice i'm not judging people for that but just the awareness that that when you do that you know that's all part of of this illegal economy that we've been mm. talking about uh, and in so many other dimensions as well when you when you see forced labor, you know, working in some cases for a pound a day, you know, in, in some of the things that, you know, again, these are the victims of human trafficking in, in that sense. And and we'll all, in our everyday way, we'll walk around the streets of London or whatever, we'll see just, we'll see glimpses of the product of this financial crime ecosystem. You know, we, it's not always apparent, but but there'll be signs of it. Mm. and And... I think just to be better aware that this touches in every corner of our livelihoods. You know, we keep coming back to this point that this is a big business, it's dirty business, it has real life consequences for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It matters. Ethan, what you say? I think that's a great note to end on. And um, we always ask you to answer the big question of our episode in just a sentence or two. So for this one, uh, what's the truth behind financial crime? What would you say, Rob, maybe to go first? This is big, dirty business with real-life consequences. We have to do better at, at stopping it. Nice. David? I'm going to twist it if I can, which is just uh, the, the question, just to say, what is the answer to that problem, which is break down the silos and come together? Great. Nice. Great mic drop moment to end it on. And, uh, <laughs> and thank you for joining. It's great to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks, great, guys. Great thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank Thanks, you. David. Nice to see you, Rob. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Green Room by Deloitte. We'll be back next time with another big question. This podcast is produced by our very own pod squad and hosted by George Parrott, Lizzie Elston, Ethan Wirth and Tiffany DeConnick. 
Thanks to our creative studio for their technical support, original music by Ali Barrett from our consulting team.